Hi, everyone. I am so happy to be talking to Sam Desmet right now. Sam, how are you? Good. I'm doing great. How about you? Very good. Very good. Of course, you know, uh, life is what it is right now, but uh, we adapt as best we can and, uh, you know, try to give the people what they want and what they need. Well, I don't know about what they want, but what they need. <laughs> You know, our live music, but we hope it makes sense. How have you been doing? Good. I mean, uh, believe it or not, I've, I've been pretty busy, actually. You know, um, it's like most musicians, you know, trying to be creative during these uh, challenging times. Um, but yeah, I mean, most artists are creative in the head, you know, so they find a way to make it work. And um, I mean, I've tried m multiple diff different ways on on doing things. So of course, it's a little bit uh, puzzling at the beginning, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited because I started I started a lot of new projects and uh, I mean, none of them are, you know, in the final stage yet, but you know, you start thinking, of course. So it's, it's you know, believe it or not, I'm trying to make the best of the, the situation and uh, I'm excited actually. <laughs> Good, I mean, you know, the thing is, there is a, an opportunity now to like regroup and get ready for what's next. Absolutely. Instead of always trying to catch up all the time, like as a musician, you know, learning new things, uh, you know, practicing new things, creating new projects, like, you know, building new repertoire, it's a lot, of, it's, it's a big opportunity. Of course, the restart is going to be really, really hard because it's probably all going to restart at the same time, but we hope it's going to work for everyone. I know that like we're, we're like tearing our hair out, trying to figure out when touring starts yeah. How are we going to make it work? But we will try, <laughs> you know. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's funny because you're you're obviously because of the limitations, uh, a lot of things are happening online, you know, the same way as we're now communicating too. And uh, it's interesting because you know, obviously, technology is you know advancing, and but I do notice that a lot of artists are taking advantage of that, you know, and it doesn't really matter. You know, we're both in Orlando here, but uh, I did a project with a dancer from uh, Japan that uh, is currently in Paris and it worked out fine. It was great, you know, and we're planning. It's That's the thing, you know, th this thing happened out of the blue. Actually, we were both kind of looking around and eventually it became a, a thing and we worked together and, and, and we're already thinking about, you know, after the dark cloud is it's gone and um, to keep on collaborating, so for sure, it's it's it's. I don't know. I'm 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 positive about this more than. Very good, very good. So, uh, so what else are you doing? Um, well, I uh, a couple of friends of uh, mine uh, invited me over to be part of a, a nonprofit. Um, I used to live in Miami before I moved uh, to Orlando, and uh, it's a it's a nonprofit uh, organization. It's called The Last Hundred. And uh, it started just, I, I'd say, like three or four months ago, so right in the middle of the pandemic. But they're all, uh, we're all musicians. There's a conductor in there, there's a clarinet player in there, a composer, another guitarist, a uh, soprano singer. And we're trying to uh, shine light on the last hundred years of uh, composition or composers that wrote music of the last hundred years. And the reason why we picked the last hundred years is first of all, that name is, you know, pretty obvious, you know, what this is about uh, when it comes to music, at least. But also, if you look at the last hundred years, it's a kind of transition mode for a lot of composers. You know, a lot of composers started writing atonal music. Um, we're kind of bleeding out on, on, on um, you know, we're, we just had the 19th century where there's like this huge peak in virtuosity and um, tonality becomes... Uh, oversaturated almost and you notice that a lot of in the last hundred years a lot of people are still searching kind of similar to what people are now facing right i mean we're trying to figure out ways to deal with the situation um and we find that interesting because it's kind of like a a, a bridge between tradition and, and uh, progressive writing so it's that transition mode that we're kind of looking into and, and, and working with, with several composers, composers that passed away, that are no longer among us, but wrote the important works, uh, but also new composers, young composers we're working together with. Um, yeah, so we're really busy with that. 
uh, setting it up. I'm sure you know too that starting up a new project like that, nonprofit organization, takes a lot of time. So. Oh yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> I do. I just came out of a board meeting just now. <laughs> so also, like it's interesting because the last hundred, instead of saying like the 20th century, keeping right. it the last hundred years as we move along, exactly. like in 20 years, it's going to be from the 40s, right? And so. It makes sense that uh, it's a different way of looking at it that makes a lot of sense. Plus, I think it happens to be that the last pandemic, big pandemic, was 1918, 19. So it's like 100 years ago. So it's like it's, a, it's kind of interesting that, you know, it's the music that happened between the two. Meetings. But most interesting for me is like the way that it's going to keep moving forward as, as the time moves along. I think it's going to make it very interesting. For us, like we went... Uh, the route of living composers that's what we've been pushing as much as we could since the very beginning and um, of course our means are limited but you know it's uh, it's uh, I think important uh, to uh, uh, for us like you know I, I I know like what it is to be like un uh, appreciated unheralded like especially when you're writing contemporary classical music and when you're alive like it's really hard to get recognized when you're alive and uh, and so we're trying to do that so that the composers don't have to wait until they're dead <laughs> to have any kind of success you know it doesn't right. make much sense so uh, i just you know just just as a side note here i just find it really interesting too that if you look at uh, program notes from the last let's say the last 50 or 60 years it's remarkable that uh today the way people approach uh, programming of music is very different compared to 50, 60 years ago. You know, uh, 50, 60 years ago, Prokofiev was still kind of contemporary, you know? And you see that, you know, like uh, if you look at uh, program notes of uh, Rubinstein, for example, you see music uh, programmed by Phil Obos, which was, you know, from the, from the same generation, basically. And somehow a, sh a really shift happened in the 20th century where a lot of a lot of the musicians uh, tend to either go very uh, you know contemporary like everything, and uh, are, are the other composer uh, sorry other performers tend to go completely the other way like trying to uh, perform uh, historically correct performances and, and tend to focus on let's say for example big composers like Bach or Beethoven, um, but there's like not really a uh, kind of like bridge and that's and that's mainly what. I think is 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 we need to go back to you know, and yeah, that's that, kind of, that, that's very true. That's very true. Not only that, I think that that whole historical aspect of, uh, of music performance, for sure, music performance, and in 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 a certain way, like opera performance, uh, theater, you know, is like the the the, the it, that's a new phenomenon. Like people were basically only playing contemporary music for a long time, <laughs> forever, right. up right. until. Then the, the 20th century, and then all of a sudden, I oh know, like opera companies play one new work every 10 years. Like, whereas in the 19th century, they were all playing 19th century operas and, you know, like, and so forth. In the 18th century, they were all playing 18th century operas, which were contemporary at the time. So this is a new phenomenon. And it, to me, I think it kind of coincides with recorded music and the way that is has affected the way we listen to music and uh, experience music, not only listen to music, but experience music, uh, live music versus recorded music, uh, mm -hmm. versus now like music and your wireless earbuds that stream that you don't even choose. Like, you know, it's a completely different way. And But all of this is relatively recent. And, uh, you know, we're both, uh, I think in Orlando, there's a large group of musicians and people who are trying to break that mold and mm -hmm. mix it up and say, Hey, you know, even sometimes in the same concert, new works, old works, like, you know, and it, who cares if it's good, it's good. If we like it, we like it. This is what we're offering. Take it like, or, or experience it with us. Like, I think it's a very good thing. Yeah. The norm remains the same, right? Whether, it, I mean, you're as a, as a, as a composer, but also as a performer, you're making choices and you're making choices in an artistic way, regardless if this, these are choices based on, uh, I mean, of course, I'm not going to lie, a lot of these choices that I'm making is based on, uh, you know, my background as, you know, uh, being a scholar and, you know, getting all those degrees and whatnot, you, you know, you obviously, you get exposed a lot too. But it's, it's interesting, like going to places 
like you're saying, like Fimekua programming uh, performances that are mixing those things, you get exposed to things you wouldn't be exposed to in the first place, you know, which is great. I, I, I love the fact just going, even sometimes I go to the movie theater or, or, or opera or whatever, I have no idea what the opera is about and I don't know the composer. And I'm like, okay, I, it's Friday or it's Saturday. I used to do that when I was still in, uh, living in Europe. I used to live in, in Ghent, which is a historical city. Uh, but sometimes I would just, uh, on Friday, I would just drive to Brussels, get a, a go to the opera, and, and, and I don't know what's playing, but uh, very often you get those last minute tickets, fairly cheap because opera can be, can be expensive. But, but you show up and you pay $20 and you see a world-class performance of, of, of composers, performances uh, you never heard of, but, you know, it's, it's great. It's, it's much, it's much uh, more entertaining, in my opinion, at least, or a, a better experience than uh, another Netflix uh, night, which, which could be okay as well, obviously. But, uh, but let's talk about your concert. We're broadcasting your, your 2018 concert at Timucua uh, on Friday at 7.30 p.m. So talk to us a little bit about that concert. Well, um, actually, it's funny that that, that concert is kind of like a, a, a flipping moment for me because um, I um, I actually reached out to, to different area, different uh, performance venues uh, in, in Florida. I just moved. Uh, well, no, I, I, I was already three years living in Miami, I believe. Um, and then so I was expanding, you know, just trying to kind of see what, what I can do with the program that I had. And uh, I, I ended up uh, being in contact with, with Chris Belt from Timakua. And um, I, I just basically, I walked in his office and like, hey, here's a coffee and here's a piece of cake. Let's do a walk. And uh, by the end of the walk, he decided to uh, program me, which, which was great. And then uh, by the time, it was a year in advance. And by the time the date came closer, <laughs> it's funny because I actually moved to uh, Orlando. So it was, that, was, that was my first concert I did in Orlando, which is it's great. And it's a whole different scene, obviously, than, than uh, Miami. So it's it's great to kind of that you guys do that. To uh, I, I haven't seen the performance. I mean, I know you send me the video after, but I tend not to do that. But it's always good to have like a a, a, a period to go over to to kind of leave it dormant, I guess, and then to kind of go through that. Uh, so I'm excited as much as. Uh, as any other audience member, I guess. Hopefully, you know. <laughs> no, but, yeah, for sure. And so what what was that program like? What can people expect? Well, um, I did a little bit of, of, of that same idea. I tried to uh, uh, mix and match, obviously. I mean, again, my education has a lot to do with that as well. But I, I uh, tried to get a uh, mix and match between very well-known standards in the guitar repertoire for as much as we do have them. Because, I mean, for, for guitarists, we always talk about standards, but if you bring up those particular composers, uh, a lot of people that are not familiar with guitar have never heard of those composers. But that, that I don't think a lot of uh, guitarists think that as a, as, a, as a disadvantage, but I think that is more as an advantage because the guitar has this great history that is you know, present in every culture. Um, and, and so I did that, you know, I, I, I played um, 19th century music, I played 20th century music, and one of the bigger pieces that I played is a, a theme and variations on folias, folias de España. And again, folias de España is a theme that comes from the 16th century. And there's many composers throughout um, history of music, up even up until today, still uh, composers write a set of variations on that uh, theme. And, and this particular theme, it's uh, um, a Mexican comp composer who's well known in the guitar world, uh, Manuel Mario Ponce. He wrote a 20 variations uh, piece uh, on that, uh, 20 variations on, on that particular theme and a fugue on top of that. So it's, it's, it's a large work, but I think every single movement has something very, very unique. Um, and then I believe uh, I also play another set of variations, which is a theme of Mozart, but it's from uh, a contemporary um, guitarist from the same time from, from Mozart. Uh, Fernando Sor, which is again a milestone in uh, the guitar uh, history when it comes to technique, but also the way people are writing. And again, those composers, you know, the uh, guitar composers uh, in the 19th century are usually uh, guitarists themselves. In the 20th century, uh, a lot of um, 
composers that have never written for the guitar or don't even play the instrument uh, start writing for the guitar, thanks to uh, people like Julian Breen, John Williams, Segovia, etc. So, and I like that idea, you know, because obviously if you're a guitarist, you tend to go back to the very cliche things, uh, which is sometimes fun, you know, but like Mozart, you know, if you listen to Mozart too, you have those cliches. And then the, the time when you expect another cliche, of course, Mozart changes that and uh, picks your attention back. You know, so that's what I'm trying to do, actually, and hopefully uh, I managed to do so with this repertoire. So lots of contrast, different cultures, different composers, etc. Very good. Thank you so much. So listen, uh, everyone listening at home uh, right now, <laughs> whenever that is, uh, you can watch the concert at 7.30 p.m. And you can find it at uh, facebook.com slash Timukwa Arts Foundation or uh, at the Timukwa website, so timukwa.com. Uh, you can find the event or uh, go to YouTube. So youtube.com slash Timukwa Arts. That will bring you to that concert. Uh, thank you so much, Sam, for talking to me. And I yeah. wish you the best. And hope that uh, we get to see a new performance uh, in 2021. For sure. I'll, um, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for programming. And everyone, uh, everybody, thanks for listening and tuning in.